Welcome to my recap of Servant Season 2. If you need a recap of Season 1 first, click the card in the upper right corner. Otherwise, grab a piece of Crocombouche and enjoy the recap. At the Turner home, having found a lifeless doll in her baby's crib, Dorothy frantically searches for her son. Meanwhile, Sean bandages his severely burned hand. He is interrupted when he overhears his wife's panicked voice, speaking to someone. He finds her in the foyer hanging up the phone. He stays silent as she exclaims that Jericho and Leanne are gone. Who did you call? He asks. The police, she answers. Who do you think? Sean quickly tears down the balloons and signs from that morning's baptism, erasing any evidence that a baby was in their home. When the cops arrive, they listen to Dorothy's claims skeptically. Her insistence that dead cult leader Mae Markham was in their home does not help. When Julian and Natalie arrive, they conspire to privately assure the cops that Dorothy is delusional. There was no baby. And separately, Julian tells Sean that it's a good thing the baby is gone. Jericho's absence means no evidence of their crime keeping the unknown child. No bubba, no crime, he says. Then he notices the under-eye masks he left on and removes the large green patches. Officer Reyes, now believing Dorothy to be delusional, and the others complicit in her delusion, says to Julian, I hope you guys know what you're doing. Then the police leave. After inspecting his badly burned hand, Sean rejoins Dorothy, who is now frantically printing flyers with the image of Leanne's aunt, Mae Markham. She insists they must put these up and gather information quickly because the first 48 hours after someone goes missing are crucial. Sean offers to distribute the flyers and minutes later drops them in a recycling bin. Later, he finds Dorothy watching more of her old reporting on Leanne's cult, the Church of the Lesser Saints. She interviews various people claiming to have witnessed the church's healing abilities. She is skeptical of the claims, while Sean is uncertain, but he keeps that to himself. Then, checking through Leanne's things, he finds her Bible, where his name is written next to a verse on leprosy. The next day, Sean tells Julian that they have to do something before Leanne involves the whole neighborhood in her search. They have to find Jericho. Who? Julian asks, noting Sean's apparent belief that the missing child belongs to him and Dorothy. The baby, Sean says, the fucking baby. So Julian does something about it. He snoops in Jericho's room and grabs one of his baby shoes. He also grabs the doll and drops it in the trash, along with more of Dorothy's flyers, these ones with Leanne's picture. That night, tensions boil, and Dorothy tells Sean that she thought he would be a better father. You know what I thought? Sean says. I thought you'd always protect him. I never thought that you would... He stops himself. What if he's dead? He asks. I would follow him, she says, assuring she would take her own life. Knife, rope, or pills? Sean asks. Not a rope, she says, with my Hermes belt next to his crib. Her alarm goes off, signaling the 48-hour mark. Sean holds her until they are interrupted by a knock on the door. Dorothy finds an envelope, and in it, her child's shoe, and a paper that says... Tell no one, baby lives. The next morning, Sean rescues Dorothy's doll from the back of a dump truck, and he bathes it as though it were truly his child. Two days later, Julian's PI, Roscoe, knocks on the Turner's back door, and Sean lets him in. Sean asks where he's been, and Roscoe says he was out front in his car all night, as Julian told him to keep watch. Sean stares slack-jawed as Roscoe searches for his car keys, and asks if there's any food left over from the baptism. Sean's only response is, What? He gives Roscoe some of the caramel French toast he prepared for Dorothy, then quickly hides him when Dorothy walks by. Julian asks Sean to talk sense into her, as she's planning to go into work. The studio called and asked if she can cover for one of the reporters who was out. It's been four days, and I can't just lie here, Dorothy says. I need to reassure Jericho that everything's going to be okay, suggesting that if the kidnappers are watching the news, maybe Jericho can have a little mommy time. With Dorothy gone, Julian and Sean join Roscoe in the basement. They quickly learn that he has no memory of the last four days. However, they check his phone and find he accidentally recorded 12 seconds of footage from his pocket. In the recording, they hear chains and Roscoe crying, 
begging to make it stop. They also hear Leanne reassuring him that he'll be okay. They are there to help him. Surprised to hear his own terrified voice, Roscoe says that he doesn't remember a thing. Unsure what to do, Sean suggests they call Natalie. She hypnotizes Roscoe and unlocks some memories. He recalls being taken to a dark room where he smelled something rotten. It clearly disturbs him as he starts crying. He mumbles, he's behind the door. Then, they're on their knees for him, they're bleeding. His hand is a hook. Sean asks if the baby was there, and Roscoe says, the baby is crying. Passing baby forward where he waits, he's holding him. He takes out the eyes and he throws them away. As Roscoe becomes increasingly distressed, Natalie wakes him up. Dorothy's news report begins. She speaks as though a baby is listening. Hello, Dorothy says. This is the news before bedtime. Her co-anchor looks confused as she continues speaking in her oddly soothing tone. After the hypnotism, Julian writes off Roscoe's ramblings as a result of a drug-induced hallucination. Natalie disagrees and Julian storms off, upset by her and Sean's indulgence in the supernatural. On the news, Dorothy ends by announcing Leanne Grayson is missing, shows her picture, and asks for anyone who has information on her whereabouts to come forward. She closes out the broadcast by saying, Night -night. Later, while Dorothy is showering, Sean gets a call from an unknown number, but recognizes the voice as Leanne's. Why is she looking for me? Leanne asks. Dorothy's shower stops as the pipes rumble, and water oozes from the cracks in their basement floor. Sean asks where she is, but Leanne only responds with her own question. Why haven't you told her what she did? The next day, Dorothy reviews the latest tips received from the public, after her on-air plea for help. However, the reported Leanne sightings thus far have all been false alarms. They FaceTime Julian, who is scoping out one of the locations where she was supposedly spotted, a gated mansion. Per Dorothy, it belongs to the Marino family. Julian spots someone drop something off. He investigates it and finds a takeout menu. The next day, Dorothy has an idea. If they pose as a restaurant, they can leave their own takeout menu and get in the house by delivering food. They decide on pizza as the cuisine and work together on crafting a fake restaurant menu. Per Julian's suggestion, they go with the name Cheesus Crust, hoping it'll appeal to the Marino family's religious proclivities. Julian drops the menu off at their home and some of their neighbors' homes to avoid suspicion. Eventually, calls start rolling in, and the pizza is well received by many of the Marino's neighbors. And eventually, the Marino's themselves order 20 cheese pizzas. Julian rushes from the opera to deliver the pizzas, but as Dorothy points out, wearing a tux, he will not pass as a delivery man. Instead, they send Sean's assistant, Toby, along with a hidden camera in the form of an iPhone in his front pocket. Toby objects, but is quieted by Julian's cash tip. Toby arrives at the Marino's while Sean, Julian, and Dorothy watch through the camera. Julian heads to the basement for more wine and finds he has to cross a wooden plank over a part of the floor that's collapsed due to the pipe issue. On the way out, he nearly falls but manages to rescue the wine. At the Marino home, Toby is let in by a group of children. They send him upstairs for payment. At the top of the staircase, he turns down a hallway and sees Leanne. She asks why he's there, then quickly leaves. Rather than follow, Toby heads to another room where an ill woman calls to him. Toby enters and the frail woman pays him. Afterwards, Toby accuses Julian of sending him to spy on Leanne. Mission accomplished, Julian says. Welcome to the CI fucking A, then hangs up on Toby. Then, Julian is surprised to see the Marino family order another pie. This time, Dorothy prepares the pie herself. Toby delivers it, and instead of running, Leanne invites him in to sit down and talk. She apologizes to him for leaving the Turners without saying goodbye, but she was afraid he would try to talk her out of it. She goes on to say that she left because of Dorothy. I couldn't live with her for another day, Leanne says. She's selfish, and she's cruel. Hearing this through Toby's spy camera, Dorothy leaves the room. She returns in time to hear Leanne telling Toby that he must not let the Turners know Leanne is there. Then Leanne turns pale and stands up to steady herself before fainting. 
Then Julian takes them off mute, as Toby panics saying he needs to call 911. I wouldn't recommend that, Dorothy says calmly. You've just entered a private residence and drugged a young woman with pizza. As Toby panics, Dorothy continues, instructing him, pick her up off the floor, put her in the back seat of your car, and drive her here. If you don't do that, I'll call 911 myself. Then she hangs up and takes a bite of pizza. Later, Leanne wakes up in the Turner's attic. Dorothy questions her, but Leanne claims not to know where Jericho is. Downstairs, Dorothy tells a hesitant Sean that they must keep Leanne isolated and break the Colt's brainwashing. She adds that Sean must not visit Leanne, as she'll manipulate him. Dorothy leaves for work just as the builders arrive to fix the collapsed floor in their basement. With her gone, Sean tries several keys to the attic door, but can't find the right one. Then he meets with Julian, who agrees that holding Leanne captive is, as he puts it, a whole new level of skullfuckery. He also agrees that Leanne will not help Dorothy. Sean needs to be the one to talk to her. In the attic, Leanne has made herself at home, decorating the room with Christmas lights and other items she's found in the old boxes. Just before 2 a.m., Dorothy wakes with a start. She comes to the attic, painfully grabs Leanne's hand, and begs her to return Jericho. You're hurting me, Leanne says. Then Dorothy leaves in a huff. Later that morning, Dorothy delivers breakfast to Leanne, who cowers behind a mannequin she's dressed in some old clothes. She continues to ignore Dorothy's inquiries on Jericho, and instead asks to speak with Mr. Turner. Dorothy denies the request and leaves. While Dorothy is at work, Sean finally finds the right key and opens the door. He greets Leanne, and she asks Sean again, why haven't you told her? You don't know Dorothy, Sean says. You don't know what it would do to her. She deserves whatever's coming her way, Leanne responds. Sean tells her that no punishment would compare to what Dorothy would do to herself, then offers Leanne anything she wants in return for telling him where Jericho is. She asks to use the bathroom in place of the bucket Dorothy's left her. So Sean escorts her and guards the door while she does. While in the bathroom, she notices Sean's bloody bandages. Returning to the attic, she finds that Sean has left her Bible on the bed for her. That night, at 2 a.m., Dorothy visits again. She grabs Leanne by the hair, drags her across the room, and strangles her, demanding to know where Jericho is. Then, Dorothy leaves and returns to bed. The next morning, she tells Sean that she gets panicky at 2 a.m., as though her body remembers something her mind forgot. After she heads to work, Sean visits Leanne and asks her to bring him back. She demands to know who Sean is looking for, and when he says Jericho, Leanne responds, Jericho died, Mr. Turner. That night, Leanne prays with her Bible open to the page where she'd written Sean's name, and suddenly, at dinner with Julian and Dorothy, Sean can taste again. A couple of nights later, Dorothy makes her 2 a.m. visit, but instead of Leanne under the covers, finds the mannequin. Leanne hits her over the head with a metronome and runs downstairs, but finds the front door locked from the inside. Behind her, Dorothy approaches and hits her with the metronome, knocking Leanne out. Later, Sean wakes up to pain, feeling in his hand has returned, and he rushes to run the burns under cold water. With fresh bandages, he looks for Dorothy and finds the attic door open. He sees the mannequin in Leanne's bed and runs downstairs to find Dorothy standing in the kitchen, as though in a daze. He sees something dripping from her hands. When he recognizes the stains on the front of her pajamas, he runs to the basement and finds Leanne buried in their basement's collapsed floor, with a small hose allowing her to breathe. Sean quickly digs her out and she gasps for air, while Sean tells Dorothy that she's gone too far. Nothing is too far, Dorothy says to Leanne. After cleaning up, Leanne returns to the attic and Sean tells her she's not a bad person. She just loves him that much. In an earlier time, Dorothy stands over an empty crib while her son's body lies undiscovered in the car. The time is 2 a.m. One morning, Leanne wakes up to find the door left open for her. In the kitchen, Dorothy lets her know they've decided to let her free for a bit every morning. 
She makes Leanne pancakes, and even invited Toby over, as she thought Leanne could use a friend. He thoroughly enjoys the pancakes, while Leanne refuses them. After the awkward breakfast, Dorothy brings Leanne back to her prison and apologizes for hurting her, then adds, You have to understand, for Jericho, there is nothing I wouldn't do. Nothing. Later, Dorothy receives a tiny plastic baby in the mail, along with a note stating, Bring 200000 to the Franklin Mall food court, 8 p.m. tomorrow, cash only. Sean assumes it's another fake ransom note from Julian, but he denies it, so they gather things to sell to come up with the 200 grand, wine, jewelry, and even Sean's prized antique coffee maker. During one of Leanne's free hours, she tells Sean that she'd like to make a cake. She hands him a list of ingredients, and Sean agrees to have Toby pick them up. Later, Toby arrives with the ingredients. Leanne asks him to stay and help bake the cake. Julian stays to watch over them, while Sean and Dorothy leave with the cash. Toby asks what they're baking, and Leanne says it's a king cake, typically made for the Epiphany, a Christian feast day that celebrates the Revelation. Her mother used to make it on Sundays, and suggested Leanne could make it for pageants. She said it could be my special skill because I didn't have any, Leanne says. I never won. When they're finished kneading the dough, Leanne reveals the final ingredient, a small baby. Her mother always said that whoever was most special got the baby, and her mother was always the special one. She would find the baby, hold it up to Leanne, and then she'd make me say it, Leanne says. You're the special one, her voice cracks, and her hand slams on the table. Toby asks where her mother is now, and Leanne simply responds, burning. In the other room, Julian FaceTimes Sean and Dorothy. It's now 20 minutes past the meeting time, and no one has shown up. Julian tells them to keep waiting, then heads to the kitchen and finds Leanne alone. She tells him that Toby left, and he escorts her to the attic. After Julian leaves, Toby comes out from hiding. Downstairs, Julian talks to Sean through FaceTime, and they have a realization. The tiny baby was ordered through Sean's account. It must have been Leanne's doing, as she could have accessed the laptop while downstairs. Julian runs to the attic and shouts for Toby to leave. He does. Then, Julian angrily asks Leanne, Why would you do that to her? She changed the bedsheets for him. She packed his little fucking monkey. Leanne approaches him and says, because I want to see her get what she deserves. At the mall, Leanne's Uncle George finds Dorothy and Sean, and returns home with them. In the attic, Leanne crouches over the cake in front of the mannequin she dressed. She animalistically shovels the cake into her mouth, as lights spark and burn out above her. She finds the plastic baby, and holds it while spitefully staring up at the mannequin. George demands to know where Leanne is, and when no one gives him an answer, he senses something rotten. George rushes to the basement and stares at their collapsed floor. It's a plumbing issue, Sean says. Foundation crumbling, George says. Is this his despair at her lack of submission? In my opinion, no, Julian replies. George heads back upstairs and sees Dorothy waiting. He demands to know how long they've kept Leanne there. A week, Sean tells him. George mutters no over and over as he runs to a window and prays that God forgive the Turners. Sean suggests to Dorothy that he speak with George privately. He points out that Dorothy only antagonizes him, but Sean can pretend to buy into his ramblings and hear him out. Leanne listens from the attic as George tells Sean about the community he and Leanne belong to. They are people that have been given a second chance at life, and they use it to enact God's plan helping others, but they can only help who they are told to help. Leanne disobeys. She was never told to bring Jericho back. Sean asks what he can do, and George insists he must bring Leanne back to the Merino home, where she was placed, and pray for forgiveness. Forgiveness for what? Sean asks, and George tells him that he already knows the answer to that. And Sean remembers getting a call from Gourmet Gauntlet inviting him to be the head judge on season two. He declines, saying he has a two-month-old to take care of. George promises to heal Sean if he returns Leanne. That's how you'll be reunited with him, George says. George heads to the basement, and Dorothy demands to know what happened. 
Sean explains that George is going to make him a salve for his wound. And he adds that George insisted Leanne must return to the Marino home. He mentioned divine repercussions, Sean adds. Dorothy is skeptical, but Sean points out the hole in their cellar appeared the day after they brought Leanne there. Dorothy thinks he's crazy. In the basement, George gathers the ingredients for the salve, including some of his own saliva, while Sean visits Leanne in the attic. He asks if she disobeyed her aunt and uncle when she came to them originally. So you came because you wanted to help, he asks. Then he asks her to help them now, but she says that she doesn't think Jericho can come home. But maybe he can, Sean says. I think we can fix it. In the basement, Dorothy offers George the 200 grand, explaining that he can give it to charity and do a lot of good with it. So George takes it and dumps it into the hole in their basement. Then he finds some of Leanne's hair there. She was down here, he asks. Her presence is an infection, George says. It's spreading. What hath she wrought? Meanwhile, Sean tells Julian to distract Dorothy while he takes Leanne back to the Marinos. Julian heads to the basement and Sean grabs Leanne. But before they leave, she begs him to take her not to the Marinos, but anywhere else, far away where her family can't find her. Sean agrees, but she knows he is lying. Then Sean recalls an earlier time. Dorothy holds Jericho and asks if he can take the baby for a second. But Sean is busy. He is on the phone, agreeing after all to leave his family for LA and appear on the show. I promise, Sean says to Leanne. Then a breaking news report captures their attention. In the basement, insects crawl out of the hole in the ground, chasing Julian and Dorothy upstairs. They join Sean and Leanne, staring at the news report on TV. Gunshots were heard at the Marino home, and the body count is uncertain as they await further details. Joining them, George angrily says, Look what you have done! The Turners and Leanne only stare like deer in headlights. George blames the incident on Leanne's disobedience, then sits on the couch and prays. Dorothy questions him, but he becomes unresponsive, only staring into space. Leanne runs to the attic, locks the door behind her, and sobs, proclaiming that she never should have come here. Through the door, Sean asks for answers. Why was Leanne supposed to be with the Marinos? He sent me, Leanne answers. Someone reads the signs and tells us where we're meant to go. Everybody has their place, and I disobeyed his will by coming here. Meanwhile, Julian tries getting George to snap out of it, but he just continues staring at nothing, only letting out some quiet guttural noises. In the attic, Leanne lowers her nightgown and cries as she whips herself on the back. Dorothy calls her station to get details on the Marino story and learns that it was a triple homicide and the youngest child is missing. A little boy, she tells Sean. Suddenly, the cops arrive at the Turner home. Dorothy quickly orders Sean and Julian to hide George while she handles the police. They drag him into the kitchen while Dorothy greets Officer Reyes. She asks for Sean and the three of them sit down to talk. Reyes is there because of a connection between the Turners and the Marinos. She points to the Cheez's crust flyer and an image from Dorothy's news broadcast asking for information on Leanne, the Marinos babysitter. So, Dorothy admits they spied on the Marinos, as they were looking for Leanne, whose cult is behind Jericho's kidnapping. They're probably also behind whatever happened at the Marinos. Reyes says Dorothy is wrong. Mr. Marino is the perpetrator. Dorothy's distressed mind is simply attributing meaning to coincidences. In the attic, Leanne watches Sergio's, the Missing Marino Boys, YouTube channel, where she made a guest appearance. And as his laughter plays through the speaker, she frantically constructs crosses. Before leaving, Officer Reyes insists on having a look around. She heads to the attic and finds dozens of hay crosses strung up under the ceiling from one side of the room to the other. She assumes it is Dorothy's doing and emphasizes to Sean that his wife needs help. The officer suddenly feels faint and heads back downstairs, taking one of the crosses with her. And finally, she leaves. Shortly after that, Leanne turns on the TV and is horrified to hear, 
The Merino boy's body was discovered in a concealed crawl space underneath the stairs. Suddenly, a knock comes at the front door, and outside, Sean finds a package addressed to George. He opens it and finds a Betamax tape. George appears behind the three of them, saying, The answer has come, adding that Leanne must watch the tape tonight. He asks for their Betamax player, and they inform him they don't have one. Wrong decade, George, Julian says. George walks upstairs with the tape. Dorothy tells Sean to let him go and shows him a note she found in the box, stating, Reunite them, Christmas Eve. Dorothy assumes it means that she will be reunited with Jericho on Christmas Eve. In the attic, Leanne sobs and frantically rips her crosses down, then sits and breaks the switch she used on her back. Above her, the window suddenly shatters. In the basement, Sean applies George's salve to his wound. Meanwhile, George removes a panel from the package, revealing that beneath the tape, there is a knife, some vials, and some other tools. The next day, Dorothy is in higher spirits after the note. She stays out of George's way, allowing him to make preparations for whatever comes next. Meanwhile, Julian stops by the attic door and tells Leanne that if she ever wanted to, she could talk to him. She takes him up on the offer. The doorbell rings and Dorothy finally meets Roscoe, who insists they talk outside. At first, she's frustrated to learn that Julian and Sean hired a PI without her knowledge, but quickly asks what he was able to learn, and he tells her about Leanne's burned down family home. In the attic, Leanne tells Julian about her past. George and May are her chosen family. They're not actually related to her. They said that God sent them walking down the road where I was buried in ash, Leanne says. They told me that God had given me a second chance. She puts on some music and tells Julian that she was always barred from listening to it. She was told that it's a dark temptation. She also tells Julian that she used to believe Dorothy was a perfect mother and so much warmer than her own, but she was wrong. That's fucking unfair, Julian says, pointing out that what happened with Jericho wasn't her fault. He blames himself and plays a voicemail for Leanne where Dorothy begs him to just stop by while Sean is gone. She could really use his help, but Julian was too busy taking drugs. Leanne is disturbed and shares her own story. Her mother had a green dress she loved. Leanne thought if she destroyed the dress, maybe it'd make more room for her mother to love her. So she burned it and wasn't scared as she learned how fast fire grows. She just felt angry, like she was burning too. My aunt and uncle said it must have been God working through me, Leanne says. That terrible things happen for a reason. Do you think that? Julian asks. I think that if that's God, then I don't want anything to do with him, Leanne answers. Outside, Dorothy gets cold and tries to head inside, but Roscoe stops her. When she and Sean insist, he finally admits that George told him to keep them outside until sunset, no matter what. Dorothy storms past him and corners George. He calmly tells her that he needed time to prepare. We must do these things alone, he says, and promises that the reunion will happen when the clock turns. Skeptical but satisfied, Dorothy leaves him to his work. Meanwhile, Sean kicks Roscoe out of the house. But before he goes, the P.I. tells him that he can trust George. They're not like us, Roscoe says. They're special. In the attic, Leanne and Julian lie on the floor together. Then she kisses him. In the guest bedroom, George places a cassette into a stereo and plays the B-52's Love Shack while repeatedly slamming his head against the wall. In his bedroom, Sean finds that the wound on his hand has healed significantly. Above him, Leanne and Julian take things further. As she makes love to him, Julian weeps. That night, George quietly makes his way into the attic and finds the two of them lying together. Why are you holding that knife? Leanne asks. Do you want to hurt me? You said that you loved me. She sits up, knocking over a candle. As the carpet catches fire, George falls and stares in terror. As Leanne says, everybody lies to me. She'll come for you, George says. Let her, Leanne replies. I can handle May. Not May, 
George says. Then panics and runs out of the house. Leanne watches through a window as George is struck by an oncoming car. The next day, Sean plucks a goose he's preparing for lunch, and Dorothy prepares for her reunion with Jericho. She is shocked to find that George is missing. In the attic, Leanne calmly tells Dorothy that he left. Dorothy assures herself that George will be back in time for lunch, then heads downstairs to decorate the tree and informs Sean that her father is bringing a date to lunch, Courtney with a K. Sean tells her they don't need to do this, but Dorothy says they do. It's Jericho's first Christmas, and he needs his family. Outside, Julian sits in his father's car and does his best to apprise him of the situation. He is uncertain and Courtney is confused, but Julian gets them to go along with it and not ask too many questions. At lunch, Sean surprises his guests by saying grace and asking God to bring them back what they lost. Julian is put off by the prayer and gets even more stressed as he ignores call after call from Natalie. He excuses himself to the bathroom, where he scrolls through the dozens of ignored calls on his phone and indulges in some cocaine. In the kitchen, Leanne is uncertain how to act after what they did in the attic. She tells him that she feels good, more powerful. He says that what happened was a mistake. She brushes her hands lightly on his chest, and he asks what she is doing. What I want, she answers and he leaves her, then does more cocaine in the bathroom before joining his father and Courtney for charades. Outside on the front steps, Sean comforts Dorothy, who worries George and Jericho won't show after all. In his drug and alcohol-infused state, Julian plays a few rounds of very intense charades before excusing himself to the bathroom, where he ignores another call from Natalie and sniffs another line of the white powder, and another. A voicemail from Natalie begs him not to box her out and to let her speak with him. He does another line, and another. Courtney hears a thud in the bathroom and opens the door to find a collapsed Julian. His father runs over to help and finds his son is not breathing. Sean attempts CPR while Courtney calls for an ambulance. Two minutes go by, but Julian remains motionless until Leanne pounds a fist on his chest and kisses him lightly on the lips. Suddenly, he springs to life. Talk to us. How are you, boy? His father asks. I saw him there, Julian says quietly. He seemed okay. His father is confused, but Dorothy seems to understand. She heads upstairs, while Sean and Julian's father carry him out to the paramedics. Leanne heads to the basement, where she finds a noose hanging from the ceiling. Sean mustn't know about that, Dorothy tells her. What's it for? Leanne asks. Contingency. Dorothy replies, in case Jericho doesn't come back. You died to be with him? Leanne asks. Of course, Leanne, Dorothy replies. I'm his mother. The doorbell rings, and at the door, Sean finds an old woman in a black veil. I understand you're looking for Jericho, the woman says. She introduces herself as Aunt Josephine and hands Sean a Betamax player. Dorothy joins them, and the woman asks to see Leanne. Dorothy refuses at first, but eventually relents, agreeing to let her see Leanne for no more than 15 minutes. After that, Dorothy insists the woman will make the deal, Jericho for Leanne. The woman visits a scared Leanne in the attic and tells her that she cannot stay with the Turners. Then, in Jericho's room, the veiled woman tells Dorothy that Leanne is leaving tonight, and it hands Dorothy a yellow baby onesie. What is this? Dorothy asks. It's the truth, dear, Aunt Josephine replies, then leaves Dorothy alone. Sean tries to check on her, but the door is locked. Then he goes to his bedroom, and suddenly the door shuts behind him, locking him in. He pounds at it and calls for Dorothy, but to no avail. In the attic, Aunt Josephine and Leanne finally play the Betamax tape. The veiled woman tells Leanne that this tape will be her final warning. So pay attention, she says. It is an instructional video on how to perform the reunion ritual and return a lost member back to the light. It involves just a few steps. First, invocation, listening to music that holds some significance to you while hurting yourself. Next, consecration, blinding the member with a knife, oil, or hands. Then, you must slice each limb with a heated blade. And the final step, the emancipation, 
or burning the body in a hand-prepared pyre. After the tape ends, Aunt Josephine demands to know why Leanne abandoned her charge and came to the Turners. Leanne says that Dorothy needed her help, but the veiled woman replies that they are only here for one purpose, to serve him. Downstairs, Sean continues shouting for Dorothy while she holds the yellow onesie and seems to have a recollection. No, she says. In the attic, Aunt Josephine has Leanne repeat after her in a prayer. At the words, I will forget Dorothy Turner, Leanne refuses and runs, but the aunt throws her to the ground, saying, It is a sin to covet someone, even a mother, then splashes hot oil on Leanne's face. Aunt Josephine heads downstairs, and a partially blinded Leanne follows. She grabs a knife from the kitchen, and when her vision returns, runs to the basement, stumbling down the stairs. Upstairs, Sean's door opens and he heads to Dorothy. Through her locked door, he shouts for her to open it, but she refuses. They've killed him, Sean, she says, while preparing a noose tied to the crib. Sean realizes what she is doing and begs her not to. She apologizes. She doesn't mean to hurt Sean, but Sean promises he will never forgive her for this. What if he's alive, Sean asks. What is he supposed to tell Jericho? In the basement, Leanne hides and watches as Aunt Josephine lights a fire. Leanne runs for the door, but the veiled woman grabs her and throws her to the ground. Aunt Josephine slices into Leanne's arm and cuts from her shoulder down to her elbow, beginning the reunion ritual. Before Aunt Josephine can cut her again, Leanne hears a thud and the woman falls off her. Are you okay? Dorothy asks, brandishing a shovel. I'm okay, Leanne tearfully says, as Dorothy puts pressure on her wound. Dorothy goes to get help, but first Leanne tells her that Aunt Josephine wanted Dorothy to think he was gone. He's not gone, Leanne says. I'm going to bring him back to you. Dorothy thanks her and heads upstairs. See, Leanne says to an unconscious Aunt Josephine. She protected me like I'm her daughter. Then Leanne hunches over the flame and heats the dagger, but Aunt Josephine grabs her from behind and strangles her. Leanne manages to rip her veil off, startling the woman and revealing her scarred face. The woman chases after the veil. Vanity is a sin, Aunt Josephine, Leanne says, before stabbing the heated blade into the woman's eye. Sean and Dorothy head to the basement and find it empty. She's gone to get him, Dorothy assures, but Sean is skeptical. In the bedroom, Dorothy makes preparations for her son's return, while Sean sits down nervously and begins telling her the truth about what happened when he went to California and left her alone for a week. Before he can get very far, Dorothy tells him to shut up. She hears something through the baby monitor, a nursery rhyme. They head to Jericho's room and find Leanne cradling their son, singing to him. While Sean and Dorothy enjoy their reunion with Jericho, Leanne sits in her room and speaks aloud. I don't know why I keep doing bad things. Scare myself sometimes. I can feel the dark thing in me getting bigger. The power in the neighborhood goes down and the lights turn off. Leanne continues. But I'm tired of everyone telling me what's wrong with me. Maybe there's nothing wrong. Maybe this is who I am. But I know how this works. I know they're coming for me. But don't worry, I'll be ready. I know that killing you started a war. And near Leanne, in the wall space, lies Aunt Josephine's burnt corpse. Thank you for watching this recap. And if you enjoyed it, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more. Thanks for watching, and see you on the next One Take.